Good evening. Good evening. My name is Kevin Bergerson, and I am the Patient Education Program Senior Coordinator for the Colon Cancer Alliance. And on behalf of the certified patient navigators and the entire patient support team from the Colon Cancer Alliance, I'd like to welcome everyone to tonight's webinar, Colorectal Cancer, What's New and What's on the Horizon? This is the eighth segment in the Colon Cancer Alliance's conversation about colon cancer webinar series, which we created to provide the opportunity for patients, survivors, and caregivers, family members, friends, and healthcare professionals to link with national experts in colorectal cancer and other related fields in an interactive online setting. As a reminder, these conversations about colorectal cancer webinar series events occur pretty much every Wednesday of the month, third Wednesday of the month, from 7 till 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Over the uh, past year, there's been big news in colorectal cancer, including some new FDA-approved drugs and treatment options for patients. So everybody wants to know, what's next? This evening's webinar will be providing you with the latest trending information coming out from the American Society of Clinical Oncology. Everybody knows as ASCO. Uh, they just had their annual meeting regarding treatment, research breakthroughs, diet and news, and, and, and genetic breakthroughs. And we're going to talk a, bit, a little bit about some of those things this evening. Before we get much further into the webinar, I want to let you all know that about this time tomorrow, each of you will be getting an email with a link to a feedback survey about this webinar. We really want to hear back from you. We, we value your opinion, and we want to hear your honest feedback on how we can make these webinars better. So please look for that email tomorrow, and uh, please take our survey. It would be very helpful. Thank you. Help us help you. Before I introduce our speaker, just a quick note about questions. Our webinars are interactive, and the attendees can always pose questions for the presenter. After the presentation, we will be able to ask a few of the questions posed by the attendees during the webinar. Uh, we are only accepting questions posted online using the webinar control panel. So to submit a question for consideration and possible use, click on the small plus sign located next to the word questions on the webinar control panel located on the right side of your screens. Then type in your question and hit enter. All the questions will be asked on a time available basis. So, you know, I, I do apologize in advance if we can't get to your particular question. But no matter what, if we if we can't get to your question, we do have we will email you um, under the email you provided in your registration and ask follow up with a, a email to ask uh, to answer your question after the webinar. And with that, I'm going to introduce tonight's speaker. Our presenter this evening is Dr. Patrick Bolin, who is an assistant professor of oncology with the Department of Medicine at Roswell Park Cancer Institute. Dr. Bolin completed medical school at Jefferson Medical College of Thomas Jefferson University in Philadelphia. He went on to complete an internal medicine residency at Boston University Medical Center at, in Boston. He finished his training via Medical Oncology Hematology Fellowship at Fox Chase Cancer Center at Temple University Hospital. In 2013, Dr. Bowen joined the faculty at the Roswell Park Cancer Institute as part of the gastrointestinal oncology team, where he works as a medical oncologist treating patients with lower gastrointestinal cancers. His clinical interests include colorectal cancer and the development of new cancer therapies. And with that, I'm going to change the control of the webinar over to you, Dr. Bowen. Welcome. Hey, thanks. Thanks for inviting me to speak. Can you hear me? You sound great. Okay, great. Thank you. So, um, so I was posed or uh, asked to give uh, an update, anyways, on on what's new and what's on the horizon. Um, so. Uh, what I wanted to start by doing was just to, you know, remind us a little bit about uh, about colon cancer itself, and I'll, I'll try to keep this relatively short, and then kind of get on to what's what's new. Um, so really, I'm going to go over just some updated, you know, where we are in colon cancer, some background on this, 
uh, talk a little bit about rectal, rectal cancer management, um, where we stand on tumor, tumor profiling, uh, some new data on treatment for metastatic colon cancer, and then some things that I think are on the horizon, um, but not, not quite there yet. So, um, so looking at this, so colorectal cancer is, um, is, a, is a worldwide problem. Um, what, when you look at it worldwide, though, we see there's, there's a very different incidences in different, in different countries around the world. Um, and this is, this is a picture looking at the number of cases per 100,000 people. So you can see in, in what we consider, you know, Western culture, there's a, there's a, there's a higher incidence. So, so North America, Europe, uh, you know, Eurasia, really, we see a, a substantially higher incidence than when we compare this to Central and parts of South America, Africa, India. Um, and, you know, it's, though there may be some differences in life expectancies between some, some localities, uh, it's thought that in part this, this has some attribution to lifestyle differences, um, you know, including dietary and physical activity differences amongst, amongst uh, uh, places. Um, so uh, colon cancer remains in the U.S., uh, the, the third leading um, uh, so it's uh, third most common cancer diagnosed in men and women. And when you look at men and women individually, it's the third most common cause of cancer-related death. When you total the numbers together, uh, it, it's really the second leading uh, 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 cancer killer. So it's still, it's still a huge problem. We still have a lot of work to do. Um, the good news is that uh, all in all, the number of new cases of, of colon cancer and the and the number of deaths have been going down over the last last several decades. And we think part of this is due to improvements in screening techniques, um, increased uptake of screening, and being able to catch this, this disease earlier when it's when it's more highly treatable. Um, so the lifetime probability of uh, developing uh, colon rectal cancer in the U.S. is, a, is about 5%. As, as I said, the overall trends are improving. Um, it's certainly in that uh, screening age appropriate. So, you know, we typically think about 50 years and older in the average person. Uh, the incidence is, is, uh, is decreasing, the number of new cases. Um, however, there has been a, uh, a disquieting increase in the number of new cases uh, in, in uh, patients under the age of 50. So this is still a, a very small subset, or this is a small subset, um, but you know, it's, a, it's a group of concern. Um, uh, the reasons for this remain unclear, but this is a group who typically wouldn't think about screening. Um, so you know, one of the other sort of disquieting things is when we look at this, we find that really, um, uh, according to a survey taken a few years ago, only about 59% of adults uh, who were age appropriate or up to date on screening, so either by endoscopy or stool test. So it means really even in the U.S., uh, in patients in that age age appropriate range, uh, more than 40 percent weren't up to date on the screening. So some general uh, uh, risks and preventative uh, factors for for colon and rectal cancer. So this is a disease, this is an age related disease. So the incidence increases uh, as age goes up, and the the uh, the average age is is in the range of, of uh, 70 years old at this point. Um, it, uh, individuals who have a family history of cancer have a have a higher incidence, and we think probably about three to five percent of all colon cancers have a clear uh, 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 genetic cause that we can identify. The most common being Lynch syndrome, and less commonly uh, FAT, and a number of more rare conditions. Uh, uh, Long-standing inflammatory bowel disease is linked to a higher risk of colon cancer, as is smoking, uh, in increased alcohol use, um, increased intake of uh, red meats and processed meats, as well as obesity and diabetes. Uh, on the flip side, um, uh, we know that uh, individuals with increased physical activity, uh, when we compare those, uh, so when we compare patients who were diagnosed with colon cancer and those who have uh, the greatest physical activity levels compared to the least. Those with the greatest physical activity levels have a lower incidence of, of uh, colon cancer recurrence, and, and likewise, there's a lesser incidence of colon cancer on the whole. Um, there's been some linkages between uh, increased intake of uh, fruits and uh, vegetables and, and possibly high fiber diets um, uh, with a decreased risk of colon cancer, though, though some of these studies have been a little bit conflicting. 
Uh, there's also uh, been, been growing evidence on uh, uh, aspirin use and, and lower risk of colon cancer on a whole number of, of studies, uh, as well as uh, patients having good vitamin D levels and, um, and having a decreased risk of colon cancer. So I'm almost done kind of the background here. So when we look at uh, colon cancer staging, really we, the biggest, the biggest determinants of, of staging are how deep is the tumor invading, are there lymph nodes involved, and has it spread. And this really determines is it a stage one, you know, very, very early, is it somewhere intermediate, stage two or three, or is this an advanced colon cancer? And, and, and that changes what the treatments are. Um, so when we look at uh, the, the colon cancer treatment paradigm, really for stage one colon cancer, it remains surgery. For stage two and three, it remains uh, surgery, and we regularly give chemotherapy in stage three, and it's a debate in stage two, a, a, a difficult conversation often. Um, in stage four, uh, the primary treatment uh, has been and is chemotherapy, though oftentimes we do think about whether uh, patients are eligible and, and, and or should undergo uh, uh, further treatments, such as surgery or radiation therapy, among others. Um, for rectal cancer itself, uh, for uh, stage one disease, it's also just surgery, but for stage two and three, the standard is uh, treatment with radiation and, and chemotherapy. This is typically done uh, prior to surgery with a plan of giving some duration of chemotherapy, uh, four months being the standard afterwards. So with, with the advances in surgical techniques and radiation, the, the problem we have now with rectal cancer is that the, the risk of a, a distant recurrence, um, uh, which is more problematic on the whole, is, is much more common than uh, rectal cancer coming back in the pelvis, which was the historic problem. So there has been a lot of interest in looking at giving um, uh, chemotherapy initially, um, either as an alternative to, to chemotherapy and radiation or as a, a, an adjunct. Um, uh, and uh, in, in some cases, this would take the place, or in many cases, of giving chemotherapy after surgery. This is under active investigation. Uh, what we've also seen is that patients who have um, a, a fantastic response to chemotherapy and radiation. So when they go in and do a surgery and they don't find any tumor left, these patients have very, very good responses. So this, this has led uh, uh, some, some groups to look at, do we actually need to be, be doing surgery on those patients? So there's been a number of reports, and it was a group out of Brazil who really uh, was the, the, the big pioneering group on this. But in the last year, um, uh, Sloan Kettering uh, has, has presented um, Again, their data on looking at patients who had a complete response, so where, the, where they go in, so they have rectal cancer, they get treated with radiation, they go in with a scope afterwards and they can't find any tumor, and they looked at those patients who had a complete response and did not have surgery um, uh, through a discussion with the patient and the, and the physician, and they compared that to patients who had surgery and had the tumor completely vanished. And really, when they when they follow this, the, uh, the patients with a complete clinical response, so no tumor they can see on the scope out, um, what they saw was that um, uh, through a very rigorous follow-up uh, uh, program, about 77%, so three quarters really, um, had long-term follow-up with no evidence of regrowth. So the tumor was effectively gone. Um, for that, about a quarter of patients where the tumor recurred, essentially, in their experience, really just about all of them the tumor could then be removed at that point with a surgery. Um, and, and on the whole, the outcomes were, were essentially equivalent. Um, so this, so this, is, this is encouraging. This, this is uh, consistent with other reports of, of the sort of management, and there's, and there's mounting evidence to suggest that in select patients, we may be able to offer a non-surgical approach. But I would, I would just caution, this is still a relatively small number of, of total patients who have gone through this sort of treatment as compared to the thousands and, and more who have gone through a, a surgical treatment, and so it's not standard at this point. It also requires very close follow-up, as we see a quarter of patients can recur in that area. So then it's a really careful selection of um, whom this is actually appropriate for. Um, you know, also looking at this, we know that with, with our good advances in radiation and surgery, it, it, it's pretty uncommon to have a recurrence in the pelvis, but we had, you know, what we saw here, a, a higher rate there. Now they were salvageable, at least in this experience, but I think that's something to keep in mind. Um, but the benefits of this clearly are that we're not putting patients through surgery and the potential side effects and uh, of surgery, we're not putting them through anesthesia. Um, uh, and, and so I think that is potentially a step forward. So there's an, there's an ongoing um, there's an ongoing study looking at that approach. Um, 
There is also, as I mentioned, uh, because of the interest in uh, potentially giving chemotherapy as an alternative to radiation in some cases, there's an ongoing national uh, uh, study looking at um, uh, giving initial full FOX, so kind of standard chemotherapy, um, uh, versus giving, giving radiation. And in those patients who have a good response, uh, not giving the radiation itself. So it remains to be seen whether this will be just as good as, as radiation and, um, and uh, save us from exposing patients to the radiation side effects. But I think that's the hope of all of us. Um, but, you know, this is an important study that's, that's, that's ongoing nationwide and, um, and uh, there's some information on the bottom of the screen. So, so um, the, the next thing that I want to talk about is just where we stand on tumor molecular profiling. So this has, in, in metastatic cancer, this, what we're doing week by week grows. So the, the old standard has been to, to, well, the old standard was to do nothing. But the, um, the standard until recently was to get, uh, uh, to test the KRAS gene for a small part of the gene to see if there's, there's mutations there. And more and more what we've been seeing is that additional parts of the KRAS gene and also this NRAS gene are, uh, are actually uh, also helpful in predicting whether patients will benefit from uh, particular chemotherapy drugs, these drugs that target EGFR, so Herbitox or Vectivix. So really we know when patients have mutations in, in any of the parts of these genes, they don't get the benefit from these drugs, but they still get the side effects. So this, this has now become the standard, and I would really urge that uh, this, this be done before patients are considered for these therapies now, so it's something to ask, you know, has, has this been tested for? Um, in early stage cancer, so stages one to three, they're, uh, one of the, one of the, stand, the, the more standard things that we test for these days too is for this uh, MSI or microsatellite instability. So there's, a, there's a few reasons um, that the testing is performed. So the first is to determine uh, as a screening test for, for Lynch syndrome. Uh, the second is essentially that in stage two patients, we know if their tumor uh, shows this microsatellite instability, MSI, that uh, they have a better prognosis. And they, um, it, and, it, and it can have implications for what we do treatment-wise or what we don't offer. Um, and, and in stage four uh, disease, as I'll touch on, this may be something that we should be doing uh, more frequently moving forward. So when we look at the whole, the, the, at least these initial sort of molecular tests, what we see is that really you can, we find a, a smaller portion of patients, I'm sorry, we find a smaller and smaller portion of patients who benefit from these, um, from these EGFR targeted therapies like Herbitox and, uh, and Vectivix as we expand mutational testing. So, so really I think these are the standard things to be done at this point in time. So just to touch on microsatellite instability, so we see this in about 15% of all colorectal cancers and about only about 3% of stage 4 colon cancers. Most of the time when we find this, it's not related to Lynch syndrome, but about 20% of the time it will be. Um, so Lynch syndrome uh, briefly is characterized by, um, uh, uh, so it's, it's autosomal dominant, meaning if, if one person, if a, if a parent has it, there's a 50-50 chance that their child will end up having this. Um, and it's characterized by colon cancer, uterus cancer, and less commonly some other cancers. 80% um, of the time we see MSI, it's not related to Lynch syndrome, it's, it's for other reasons. And really when we see this, it reflects, uh, you know, uh, some, uh, uh, some problems in DNA proofreading. Basically the genes that uh, repair DNA when it's erroneously made are, aren't functioning correctly. And so these tumors have uh, a high rate of lots of mutations, so other than the ones that I already discussed. Um, so as I said, in stage 2 colon cancer, it has a, it connotes a better prognosis, and really this is an emerging standard for early stage disease. So um, many centers have gone to universal testing where every patient who has surgery gets this testing done, um, and many have expanded to, uh, to, to push to do this testing on an older and older uh, age group of patients. We can discuss that. Um, so, um, other things uh, that that I think are um, uh, uh, emerging and kind of becoming more standard in this. Um, so, uh, some preventative measures. So, the things we've seen in the past uh, a few years, and especially the last two big meetings, are um, the role of aspirin and vitamin D. So, aspirin 
uh, across a number of studies has really shown a consistently lower risk of, of colon and rectal polyps as well as colorectal cancer by about 20 to 40 percent uh, depending on the study. Um, and there's evidence that in individuals with Lynch syndrome, this, this increases uh, uh, risk of cancers of a, of a number of sites. Um, so, this, so the downsides of aspirin are that there's a small risk of having uh, significant bleeding events. And I think, and I think really if um, our hope is that if folks are undergoing uh, colonoscopies and screening, that, that these things we're trying to prevent can be caught early in any case. So that's sort of the devil's advocate to, to why should we take aspirin. But um, there's, there's, clear, there's clear evidence that it decreases polyps and decreases the cancer incidence. Uh, vitamin D, on the other hand, what we've, what we've seen, there's been a number of studies leading up to, to the ones presented recently uh, suggesting that good vitamin D levels are linked to a lower risk of, of, of colon cancer. So um, uh, uh, Dr. Ng uh, 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 presented some data um, at our last two meetings um, on a group of stage four colon cancer patients um, and looked at really their vitamin D levels and then essentially how they did. And so what we saw across the whole group is they had a relatively low vitamin D level, so, so 17. So we would consider that vitamin D deficient. So it's the middle of the pack. Um, and when they compared the highest fifth of patients to the lowest fifth of patients, so still relatively low numbers of or levels of vitamin D, they saw there was a 35% improvement in how long patients lived. And, and similarly, the, uh, the cancer was able to be controlled for longer in those patients who had a good vitamin D level before they started treatment. Um, now, you know, there is some caution here. We don't know that this proves that vitamin D is making them live longer and maybe something about these patients that's uh, uh, making their vitamin D level higher. And it also doesn't prove to us that vitamin D supplements will, will change the outcome. But um, I, I think for the time being, until we have more information as, as ongoing trials are being done, it's, it's reasonable to, to try to maintain a, a normal vitamin D level. And that would be, that would really, normal would typically we think about as being at least 30, which is in the highest quartile in these studies. Um, so I think the question remains, does, does vitamin D supplementation work? What's the right dose of vitamin D? Um, and what's the, the proper level to get to? And really, we don't know the answers to those. And that's, that's ongoing investigation. Now, um, other, other preventative measures that I think um, uh, we've seen more and more data on is uh, that uh, physical exercise continues to be um, of interest in decreasing risk of colon cancer. And it, it really should be a recommendation to all of our colon cancer survivors to be obtaining some amount of physical exercise. Now, we don't know, we really don't know what's the threshold you need to reach to, to get that protective effect, but um, there's, a, there's, some amount, there's some amount you need. Um, to, there's, and beyond that amount, there's probably not a huge difference, but I think regular exercise is, is good for a number of reasons, including cardiac health. Um, now, we also know when we looked at these, these studies in early stage colon cancer that was removed, when, when they looked at patients who had a, a, a prudent diet versus a Western diet, so a prudent diet is high in fruits and vegetables, poultry and fish, versus a Western diet, high in meats, fat, refined grains, and desserts that um, patients who had a prudent diet actually did better, had a lower risk of recurrence than those who uh, did a Western diet. Now, we don't have a lot of details on exactly which components of the diet made the biggest difference, but I think these data are interesting. And these are, these are um, not uh, toxic or very complicated things to, you know, to try to improve outcomes here. So I want to now switch and give a little update on metastatic. Uh, uh, colon cancer. So I want to just touch on some, some uh, chemotherapy, uh, multimodality therapy, and then some future targeted agents. And I'll try to pick up the pace a little bit maybe. So, um, so briefly, so there's been, there's been a number of drugs that we've had for years. Um, and, and the list is growing year by year. So really in the last uh, three years, we've, or we've seen two drugs approved, um, one being uh, rigorapine or Stravarga. And most recently this year, we saw the approval of Ramisirumab, Ceramza. And I think most of us in the field expect that this drug, uh, TAX-102, is going to be approved later this year. So um, uh, TAX-102 really, again, um, so these are, these are actually slides that I, I showed before. But uh, so it's a combination of two drugs that essentially target um, the, the DNA building blocks, similar to how 5 fu and Capecitabine does and a second drug that basically makes that drug work better and potentially has some anti-blood vessel type effects. 
Uh, so there's some thought that it might be able to um, work with 5-FDU and take cytokine aren't anymore. It's, it's a pill. It's typically it's taken for 10 days out of a, out of a month, essentially. Um, and these results have been presented, so this is a little slide, sorry. Uh, these have present, been presented a number of times. There's a worldwide study, and what we see is that TAS-102, it, unfortunately, it doesn't commonly shrink the tumors, but it, it tends to be very well tolerated and to control, to, to control the disease. And so I think, you know, when we're in, um, when we're in the metastatic setting, I, I think this is a good thing. It will be interesting to see, you know, moving forward, um, uh, what, what the approval looks like, and then what it looks like when we try combining this drug, this drug with some of our other standard drugs, or try using it earlier on, because it may have a, a better effect when, when folks aren't in that what we call refractory setting, where, not, where no chemotherapies are working. Um, so just a couple other words about some of what I'll call multimodality uh, 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 interventions. So there were there were two studies really looking at liver treatments at this past um, uh, ASCO. So the first one was looking essentially at this what we call uh, radiofrequency ablation. So it's it, me being a simple medical oncologist, this is akin to burning tumors uh, with a probe. Um, so essentially, we we typically prefer to do surgery when we can on 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 tumors, and usually we reserve radiofrequency ablation for when the surgery is going to be too expensive or we're doing um, uh, too much, so that we we think. Uh, you know, through a discussion at a tumor board, typically we think that patients are better off doing a less invasive approach for part of, if not all, of the tumor. So this is a this was a this was a study of about 120 patients, so not not huge. They had some problems finishing the study, and they had stage four cancer patients with um, with liver lesions that were not resectable. And in the study, the patients had up to nine liver lesions, but on average about four. Um, and so basically everybody got chemotherapy and then patients were randomized to get ablation or, or just the chemotherapy alone. And what they really saw is that patients when went ablation had a marked improvement in their uh, tumor control and their long-term survival. So I think, I think this just highlights that um, in, in patients with stage 4 disease, there needs to be a multidisciplinary discussion. Not, you know, unfortunately, many patients are not going to be candidates for these sorts of things, but when patients are eligible and can reasonably undergo these sorts of things, um, and we can target all of the disease that we see, then these may be a good option. But um, this, this again, is a, is a relatively small study. Um, we also saw data on uh, giving these uh, SIR spheres. So these are these microspheres that have a, uh, a radio tracer, so it's a way of essentially giving radiation to the liver. So it's injected uh, via the the groin into one of the arteries that feeds the liver. Um, and what, what the study did is it looked, again, same group, so patients with, with metastatic colon cancer of the liver, and everybody got chemotherapy, and then some people got SIR spheres, and some didn't get SIR spheres. And what they saw really was that when they gave SIR spheres, um, probably not surprisingly, it, it improved the amount of time that, that the tumor was controlled in the liver, and by a sizable amount of time. Uh, it didn't control the tumor outside the liver, but I don't think we should have expected that. Um, there were some side effects. There was a higher incidence of low blood count. Um, there was a small incidence of gastric ulcers, a small incidence of ascites, of ascites so fluid in the belly. Um, so we don't, we don't yet know if that's making patients live longer. We're going to have to wait longer for that information. And so I think the difficulty for us um, in the meantime is which, which patients should be appropriate for that sort of treatment. I, I can't tell you I have an answer for that. Um, so really, uh, what I want to emphasize from that, from uh, kind of the standard treatments, are that really broader molecular testing has become the new standard. There are multiple new drugs emerging. I just touched on one that I think is near approval. Um, and that really the, uh, the care of a patient with stage 4 disease needs to be multidisciplinary. So it needs input, I think, from multiple groups. Um, and and, and this, this is not going to be, um, many of these things aren't going to be used for, unfortunately, for many of our patients. but uh, for there's certainly some where we can help, you know, substantially through this sort of uh, measures. So um, I want to just touch about a couple future things in the next. Uh, tell me if I'm going over in the next hopefully five minutes or so. So um, so barring a piece from melanoma, um, we we saw some data on these immune checkpoint inhibitors. So uh, there's these molecules PD1 and PDL1 that. Uh, Simplistically, we generally think of them as being associated with an inflamed, an inflamed tumor that's generated an immune response. And 
when, when there's inflammation um, and uh, uh, T cell uh, uh, immune activation, uh, PD-1 is, is expressed and it, it basically, um, the T cells tire out. It's sort of a marker of exhaustion. So there's, there's been some drugs that have been approved in the last year that essentially target this. Uh, in essence, to take the breaks off the immune system and to activate the T cells. So uh, collectively, these drugs are now approved for melanoma and lung cancer, and I think in the next, in the future, they're, they're going to be used for a lot of other reasons. Um, thus far, we unfortunately haven't seen a strong signal in colon cancers, but in, in, in tumors where they work, we've seen very long-lasting responses in some patients where uh, they can receive the treatment and then go off and have, have the disease controlled for a very, very long time. Um, so this is just a diagram that I'll skip over. Uh, so, so the study that was presented at, um, at, at ASCO this year looked at patients with MSI high colon cancers. So that's this, this microsatellite test that I talked about before. It's about 3% of, of metastatic colon cancer patients. And so they looked at basically three groups of patients. So MSI high colon cancers. So this is a small, a tiny number of patients. Uh, I'd say run-of-the-mill colon cancer, and then MSI high other cancers. So we see this in, in stomach cancers, uterine cancers, lots of other things. Um, so when they looked at these standard colon cancers, this drug was just, frankly, it really didn't seem to work. Uh, on the other hand, we looked at the MSI high tumors, really about two-thirds of patients had their tumors shrink. Um, and when we looked at the, the totality, about 90% had either a sh shrink or stabilization of their tumors. Um, so this is, there's a, there's a rationale for why this would work, because we know MSI high tumors are, are inflamed. They have lots of immune cell, T cells in them. And uh, I think this is exciting data, but I have to caution, this is still very preliminary data. These are extremely small numbers of patients. Uh, there will, will be some ongoing studies in the very near future looking at this. Um, and I think this just, this just highlights us that MSI status, which has become standard in early stage disease, I think does appear to be relevant in metastatic disease. And, and likely should be looked at for, for our patients. Um, we also seen some data on uh, BRAF mutant tumors. So in, in these BRAF mutant patients, it's been unclear what the role is for uh, anti-EGFR therapy, so Vectobix, uh, Herbitox. Uh, in BRAF mutant melanoma, we see that BRAF inhibitors uh, produce huge responses, um, but, but so far, we really haven't seen that in colon cancer. Uh, what we've seen is that when we block when we get drugs that block BRAF, we see these other pathways get uh, signaling is increased, right? So they so they work around this. So basically, they have looked. There's been a number of studies that have looked now at uh, uh, using these BRAF inhibitors and combining them with drugs that target these other signaling pathways, so EGFR, so like cetuximab or panitumumab, uh, as well as chemotherapeutics. So. Really, I'm not going to present the individual uh, information, but there's been four studies really presented in the last uh, uh, six months again, and uh, either including or not including standard chemotherapy, using both Vectobix and Herbitux, and using different types of BRAF uh, drugs. So really, we see all of them uh, produce responses that we otherwise didn't see um, uh, previously, and that the, um, the, the top one that I've listed here uh, produce the highest response rate, so the highest numbers of tumor shrinking. And this is this is currently the subject of an ongoing study that um, uh, will will hopefully be completed soon, and will hopefully have results on relatively soon. Because I think we would all like to be able to start using these sorts of drugs in our patients with BRAF mutants. Uh, for the time being, this is still investigational. Um, what we've also seen is in another in another uh, uncommon group of, of colon cancer patients, so HER2 positive colon cancers. That, that there may be some new options coming. Uh, so HER2 positive breast cancer is relatively common, um, and uh, about 20% I believe. And we've seen a, a revolution in the treatment. It used to be one of the breast cancer groups that did the worst, and now they, they do much, much, much better due to drugs like Herceptin. So there's little data on the use of Herceptin in, in colon cancer. And similar to the BRAF data, there's been data suggesting that when we use a drug like Herceptin, we probably also need to block EGFR. So um, there's this, this, uh, this other small study presented where basically they looked at, again, a small number of patients, only 24 people, um, and they gave them Herceptin, but trastuzumab, and then a drug that blocks EGFR, lapatinib, and really they saw um, a good response rate. Um, the more than half of patients had their tumor shrink or stabilize. So I think this is this is very encouraging that, that um, I think I hope in the future we will be able to use drugs 
like these for our patients with HER2 positive colon cancer. Um, it will be difficult, I think, to conduct a bigger study of this um, in, the, in the fashion the current one was done. And that's a, that would be a struggle for all of us, I think. So um, for me, the bottom line from that colorectal cancer is that uh, molecular testing needs to be expanded, I think, for, for all patients. So certainly everybody should have uh, full KRAS and NRAS testing done. And I think, you know, potentially and probably should have BRAS testing done, BRAS and uh, MSI testing. Uh, I think, you know, in, in, in many patients, we do need to discuss um, whether there is opportunity to, uh, to treat all their disease through, through multiple modalities. For many patients, this isn't the right thing, but uh, we don't know until we've investigated that. Um, and I think there are, there are reasons to be optimistic that we have multiple new things coming down the pipeline. So um, there's, a, there's a study upcoming. Uh, the NCI match, this is not ready yet. This has been developed to one of the cooperative uh, uh, clinical study groups in the NCI. But they're looking at uh, patients with all solid tumor types. So this includes colon and rectal cancer. And basically, patients are, are, are sequenced, and uh, their, their uh, treatment is matched by the mutation or abnormality they find. So um, uh, this, this is, as I said, not open yet, but I think this is something coming down the road that help, hopefully is going to help accelerate these targeted sorts of treatments that I talked about uh, getting, getting to our patients. Um, so here's some information here, just general information about clinical trials, learning about how they can offer, um, you know, excuse me, what they can offer you, um, you know, and what they may or, or may not entail. Uh, I, mean, I encourage you to look at this if you're uh, you know, if you're interested. Um, and really that's the conclusion of my talk. Hope I didn't go too long. Uh, thank you. I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Dr. Milan. I'm going to go ahead and take uh, control back over to our side of things here. Again, thank you, Dr. Bowen. Uh, those are some amazing advances and uh, some studies that came out of ASCO, and I'm sure of, of tremendous interest to our patients and survivors in attendance tonight and uh, for those facing uh, uh, treatment issues on a daily basis. That was perfect. Thank you. At this time, we will be asking our presenter to respond to a few questions as posed by our attendees during the webinar. Um, our first question is from Mike, who asks, the topic of precise uh, precision medicine has been in the news quite a bit recently. Yeah. How do you determine which patients might be candidates for a targeted therapy and which targeted therapy might work for them? Right. No, it's a, it's a really good question. Um, so, you know, it's something we struggle with. I think um, there's, there's some of this ebbing and flowing where we get extremely excited about things and then we have disappointment following and then we get extremely excited again. Um, so, you know, um, I, 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 I think it's reasonable really to think about for, you know, probably for most of our patients. Um, there's, a, there's a number of centers, you know, including our own that have started doing their own extended sequencing of of tumors, um, you know, the concern with all these things is how much do they cost, and then what are the what are the outcomes? Do we find you know do we find more treatments? Are we helping our patients? So, I mean, some of that some of the uh, some of the benefits remain to be fully realized, and you know, we're hoping that studies like this you know like this match study will help us uh, speed up the progress, anyways, on this. Um, so I don't know if I fully answered your question, um, but you know, one of the tricky things about finding a finding a uh, mutation and then trying to treat it is it doesn't it, it it doesn't necessarily always work. So you know BRAF mutations we've known about in colon cancer for a long time, and we see them a lot in melanoma. And BRAF targeted drugs work. They work like you know they really work in melanoma, um, but on their own they really don't work in colon cancer. So it's um, it's it's complicated. <laughs> well, thank you. Uh, we have another question here from uh, Ruth Ann who asks, is it possible to do chemo first, then radiation, and will it be as effective if she has rectal cancer stage three? Um, oh, that's a, yeah, I, I, I guess I'd have to know more. Um, so uh, we, so, so I'm sorry, it was radiation first and then chemo and then surgery? Was that the question? 
Uh, she wanted to know, is it possible to do chemo first and then radiation? And will that combination be as effective as the other way around? And she has a stage three rectal. Right. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Um, so, you know, um, we really don't have a definitive answer to this question yet. I think there are a lot of individuals, including myself, who really think that um, uh, giving, you know, particularly for stage three rectal cancer, for big tumors, you know, when there's positive lymph nodes, um, you know, which is stage three, that uh, if if we're if the plan is to give chemotherapy after after surgery, that we may be doing better to give the chemotherapy initially. So um, I can't really speak to a specific case, but um, I I think in many cases this is reasonable. Uh, we don't know at this point whether that um, you know truly improves the long term outlook, um, but there's reason to think that. Um, we're getting at uh, this uh, risk of uh, distant, you know, distant uh, recurrence, um, and that the treatment is potentially better tolerated. But uh, I, I can't really speak about a specific case, um, you know, without really knowing. Okay, thank you, Doctor. Um, Sherry <coughs> has asked a question here: Is normal staining of MSH6 and the PM, PMS2 sufficient to say? that a sporadic metastatic colorectal cancer is not MSI, MSI high, even if BRAF. All right, so I'm sorry, so um, this, this was in reference, that a little, yeah. now, this was in reference yeah. to the recent ASCO NEAM right. article in May 2015. Right, 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 absolutely. Um, so I don't, I, I, I think I know what the question is getting up, I don't, I don't totally understand it, so I'm, I'm just going to sort of rephrase. So um, what, we, what we do know that I didn't mention here is that a lot of these MSI high tumors actually have BRAF mutations. Those are not uh, related to Lynch syndrome. Um, but those tumors, we tend to see that there is, uh, the, when, they, when they do staining, we don't see this MLH1. Um, so if, uh, if, if the tumor is BRAF mutant and they've done this, this staining, um, and all the you know four mismatched uh, proteins are intact, then it's I, I'd say it's, it's unlikely. Yeah, it, it doesn't look like an MSI high tumor. Um, you know, I think one of our hopes that I didn't really talk about here going forward is that um, there's a number of studies looking at combining these immune uh, uh, drugs with other with other immune activating drugs or with other sorts of targeted targeted therapies or chemotherapies. So our hope is that while these drugs didn't work alone in colon cancer or they're only working in that small subset that that with further investigation we can expand this and you know you know bring this to our patients. Okay. Thank you. Um, Jeannie asks, does the BRAF um, MSI testing take place on the tumor like KRAS? And how does a patient correct. make sure their tumor is tested? Okay, correct. Yeah. It, it's so it's a tumor test. Yeah, it takes place. Um, some some labs to do MS. There's a couple ways to do MSI testing, and some some labs or centers will ask. So ours does. If there's if they don't have a normal colon to test on, they'll ask for a blood sample to do it too. Um, so I I mean I think the the way to make you know to make sure it's done is just to ask about it. Just ask. And I think um, you know I, I think in the community in general there has been you know, some debate as to whether BRAF testing should be done uh, when we didn't have specific treatment for it. And, and I would say these things aren't necessarily available off the shelf at this point. Um, and there's also been, you know, you know, some debate, I think, about MSI. But I think, you know, you know, the more and more we see this, the more relevant it becomes to, you know, to have these things done. All righty. And Addison would like to have uh, hear your thoughts on HIPEC. Uh, for stage four cancer in the abdomen. Okay, um, tough one. Yeah, so there, so there was um, there was an educational talk at um, at ASCO on this. There wasn't really I, I didn't see any new information on this at ASCO. Um, so yeah, so I mean, HIPEC is something that has classically been used for these really. Um, uh, slow growing or, or mucinous um, appendix cancers, but um, uh, it's, it, it has been um, increasingly used in, uh, I think selectively in, in colon cancers. 
um, that are limited really just to the peritoneum. Um, and I think, um, you know, uh, the selection of, of, you know, which patients should get this is, is a little bit complicated. Um, but, but I think for, I think for certain patients, this is, this is a, you know, this is an appropriate option to look at. Um, you know, still, j just like other times when we try to take, you know, tumors out of the liver, still, you know, there's, you know, there's a, you know, these tumors can recur, right? So we have to always balance what are we putting patients through versus what are we, what are our expectations? So, um, uh, so my short answer is, I, I think there's definitely a role for it in colon cancer. The trick is just figuring out for which patients. So hope that's not too much of a cop out for you. Okay, we have a question from Scott regarding pembrolizumab. He wants to know, is there current or future research on pembrolizumab for those with MMR proficient colorectal cancer? Um, so from, I think from the publicly available data, um, I'm, I'm, I'm actually not, I'm actually not positive. Um, there are, so I can tell you, um, this is, this is, you know, publicly available data, um, you know, Bristol-Myers Squibb, this other drug, nivolumab, that's also a PD-1 inhibitor there, they've been looking at, uh, giving nivolumab to, you know, also to MSI high patients and um, at the same time looking at can they combine it with drugs like um, uh, this drug ipilimumab that, that we use in, in, in melanoma, that's one of these immune activating drugs. They've been looking at giving uh, the nevo or nivolumab and ipilimumab together in MMR proficient tumors to see if, you know, well, P1 alone doesn't work, but what if we you know, what if we combine these two? So there's a number of studies. There's a number of companies who are, uh, look, you know, and, and individuals and institutions who are looking at combining these things with chemotherapy in, in MMR proficient tumors um, or, or combining them with other immune activating drugs. So I think um, the global answer is yes. I think we're all excited about these things. It, the, the issue is really figuring out how do we, how do we best utilize them? How do, we, how do we pick the patients and how do we combine them with the right things? And that's a work in progress. Okay. Uh, Bonnie has a question. Uh, Bonnie uh, has had genetic testing and was told that she does not have does not have Lynch syndrome. Does this mean that she is not MSI high? Um, no. Okay. Is the short answer? <laughs> um. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I I would think they likely, you know, if most of our patients who we send for genetic testing, we do this MSI testing on. So I would think that likely means, you know, the MSI, you know, the microsatellite status is, is known somewhere. I would just, you know, I would just ask. They should be able to, to pull that up pretty easily. And uh, Richard has a, a good question here. It's a crystal ball question. How close oh. are... Are we to using active immunotherapy in treating metastatic colon cancer? To using active immunotherapy, um, I mean, I think I think for every patient outside of a study, I think it's unfortunately still still a ways off. Um, I mean, I think there are a lot of individuals, a lot of institutions, a lot of companies that are interested in this. So I think you know when. You know, and, and patients, obviously. So I think when the interests align, I think it's for the best of our patients. Um, so I, you know, I think I think that's unfortunately still a little ways off. But um, you know, hopefully, you know, I mean, it's getting sooner by the day. Um, <laughs> sorry, it's a bit of a fortune teller reading. <laughs> yeah, the um, that is kind of a hot topic, immunotherapy. That's um, yeah, it's on it's on everybody's mind, and and um, yeah. it, you know, it's very exciting. But I, I. Appreciate the good stab at that. Uh, Daniel has a question. Um, Daniel asks, we're a stage three colorectal patient who has been treated seemingly successfully, but who experiences recurrence a couple years down the, the road and moves to stage four. What is the most important steps following surgery, assuming that it can be done successfully to deal with, a, with rectal recurrence plus liver lesions? Um, 
so I guess my impression of the question, I'm going to try to rephrase. So stage three, recurrent to the liver, I'm not sure, rectum, and resected. I mean, I think, I think the biggest, you know, thing really up front is, is just to ensure, you know, that that's the, those are the only spots where the, where the tumor is involved. Um, you know, we know, we know that patients where we can address all the tumor, where we can get it all out or, you know, burn it out, as I said, um, that, you know, these patients really do the best. So we owe it to our patients, you know, when that's possible to make sure that that's investigated. Um, I guess what happens after that? Do we do more chemotherapy again? You know, it's a, it's a, I'd say that's really a, a, a point of debate. And I think there's, you know, a lot of people have, you know, their own sort of personal feelings about that. Um, I mean, I mean, depending on the situation, you know, you know, we will sometimes offer, um, you know, you know, further chemotherapy to try to reduce the risk. Um, but, but I think it's, you know, really debated. Um, you know, um, you know, we talked about some of the, or I, I sort of touched on some of the lifestyle things. Um, so I think, you know, all those things are are important too. But I think the first thing is to see, you know, can this, you know, can all the area of the tumor be, you know addressed and and safely we don't want to address things if we're going to leave somebody you know in bad shape or crippled from it all right thank you um richard has a question and what do you know about combretostatin about what uh combretostatin a4 combret i don't i don't know anything about it um combretostatin I'm Googling this. Um, I don't, it's a phenol. I, 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 I'm going to admit my own ignorance. I don't know a lot about it. Sorry. Alrighty. Um, I, uh, you know, I guess I'll just add briefly. So, um, on, um, on the, uh, cancer.org. So the ACS website, they have a nice, they have a nice library, uh, where you can search for alternative therapies, you know, give, gives kind of information on them and, you know, what's the evidence, what is, you know, you know, what's the reason for it. Um, so, I mean, I think these sorts of, you know, compounds, you know, you know, these natural products sort of fall in there. Um, but again, I'm just admitting my own ignorance. Well, I'd like to thank everyone for your questions. Um, we'll keep looking at the uh, questions as they come in, uh, just in case any more come in towards the end here. Um, but we're, before we go, I just want to, you know, let you know about next month's webinar. Uh, it's going to be on July 15th, 7 p.m. again, titled, Is Searspheres, Microspheres Target Radiation an Option for Me? Uh, we heard a little bit about that particular study tonight during Dr. Boland's pre presentation. Um, it, if metastatic colorectal cancer spreads to your liver, you have several options for treatment, including surgery, radiation, selective internal radiation therapy, and chemotherapy. Uh, understanding the latest advances of Searspheres, targeted radiation therapy can be critical for you and your, and your doctor to make treatment decisions, particularly if you're facing unresectable metastatic tumors limited to the liver. This webinar will provide a brief overview of the Searspheres Microspheres targeted radiation therapy as well as a review of the findings of the recent SURFLOC study presented at ASCO. The SURFLOC study was the first large study to examine the delay and regrowth of the liver tumors with selective internal radiation therapy um, com when combined with chemotherapy. So please register for today for that. As mentioned at the beginning of the webinar, the Co-op Cancer Alliance truly wants to hear from you on how we can make delivery of the webinar better. Look for that survey feedback tomorrow about this time. Uh, it will have a link to what I promise is an easy, less than five minute survey. Please uh, feel free to provide and give us any feedback you may have and be brutally honest that it will really help us ensure that we're offering the very best in webinar services to you and the survivor community. Uh, of course, if you don't wanna wait till tomorrow, I'll take a screenshot now of your computer screen and you can take the survey right now. Thank you in advance and we'd be very grateful for your feedback. Um, any, uh, I don't see any other questions that have come in right now. So with that, I'd like to uh, thank everyone for attending. We sincerely hope you enjoyed this webinar.
As a reminder, this webinar has been recorded and will be available for viewing within a week of the broadcast at ccalliance.org backslash webinars. In addition, we'll be posting some of the takeaways and top five takeaways and related information to our blog the week following this webinar. Check our blog out at ccalliance.org backslash blog. And as always, if you have uh, any comments or you want to share some thoughts with me directly regarding the webinar, you can forward them to me by email at kbergerson at ccalliance.org. Um, once again, I, on behalf of the Colon Cancer Alliance and tonight's presenter, I'd, I'd like to thank everybody for attending. And I'd very much, very much like to thank you, Dr. Bowen, for, for attending. Thank you very much. Yeah, thanks for inviting me. You're, you're very welcome, sir. Good evening. And take care, everyone. We'll see you next time.